Welcome back, guys. I do hope that you thoroughly enjoyed your last session. And I truly hope that you had some fun and some laughs in that last session. So welcome to the reshaping of industries caused by COVID and analysis of critical forces shaping growth opportunities business panel. Now, I'm not going to spend a real lot of time, just our normal reminders of cameras on, microphones muted, uh, and uh, update your name if you haven't already. And please, you should feel free to unmute yourself at any time, state your name and ask your question. If your technology or situation doesn't allow for it, feel free to drop your questions into the chat and I will ask on your behalf. And do keep in mind that if we don't get to your question, feel free to send them to me or to reach out to our two guests directly. If connection problems arise, please rejoin as soon as you can. And if after 10 minutes the problem persists, please be on the lookout for an invitation to resume the session at a different time. So with all of that out of the way, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to today's panelists. And in no particular order, we have Hendrik Mellon, the partner and CEO of Africa at Frost and Sullivan, and Marcelo Palazzi, entrepreneur, innovator, and founder of Now Partners and global ambassador for B Lab. Hendrik is a true growth expert and brings a wealth of experience from both the private and public sectors, focusing on innovation, expansion, growth, and industry development. Hendrik has designed and implemented numerous corporate and public sector growth and innovation initiatives across industries and continents across the last 15 years. Marcelo is a progressive economist, entrepreneur and leader, founder of the Progressio Foundation and co-founder of B-Lab Europe with multiple degrees from multiple institutions, including an advanced leader fellowship from Harvard University. Marcelo began his career as a young entrepreneur in his 20s, working in partnership with his engineer father in environmental diagnostics, growing a family business from the UK, Switzerland and Italy to sales in 30 countries. So I really don't think I could have found two more perfect candidates to speak about reshaping industries and growth opportunities caused by COVID. So before we do officially commence the program, the panel rather, I do have some questions for you. One is going to be a poll that I invite you to answer on screen. The other one I'm going to show as a slide and I invite you to either unmute yourself or write your answer. So here is your poll. And you may need to move the box out of the way, it will move for you. Uh, and I invite you to unmute yourself Type your responses into the chat. Let's start the conversation. Ariane, may I add one thing? Yes, certainly. Because I, I, I saw, hi everybody, glad to see you. I've actually been in Newcastle a few times. You may not be there physically, but I know that you see your city. So uh, I added this question because there's a famous professor at Harvard Business School, Clayton Christensen. He wrote a little book called, How Will You Measure Your Life? So my, my, it's actually his question, but the point is how, as a business leader, how will you measure your life, you know, let's say a few years down the road? So I think it's a slightly philosophical, but I think it's always a fun question to ask. Thank you. So would any, is anyone feeling particularly brave enough to unmute yourself and, and share with us you know, how you will measure yourself as a future business leader? or even in the chat. Perhaps something that, oh, we do have, Shilpa says, I would measure my life with how many lives I've touched, whether physically or otherwise. I think that is a great mindset to have as a future business leader. Wow, that's wonderful, fantastic. Values created. Change the existing unethical practices, Augustine, that's amazing. One more and we'll move on. How they've influenced others. 
As a successful business leader, I would measure how many lives I have impacted positively. Look, guys, thank you so very much for sharing. I will commence the panel, but do feel free to keep those thoughts coming in as well, I think, uh, and perhaps it could be a discussion at the end. But to kick off our panel, a question for you both, and a million dollar question at that. What does a post-COVID world mean? And what would it look like for us mean mortals? So is that handling goes first? <laughs> I think while, while you've got the, the floor, perhaps Marcelo, share your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, no, no, fine, fine. So uh, two things. I would like to say that a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of trends that have been uh, influencing our world as we speak. And then in a way, COVID has accelerated some of these trends. So uh, what I say, what I see in my space, in my world is um, much more connectedness. I mean, like every day I, I have the, basically the whole world on, on my computer. So much easier to get together with others. So I actually think there is a huge acceleration of how we are gonna be connected with each other. Secondly, I am, uh, as uh, Ariana said, entrepreneur from when I was 21. So I love entrepreneurship. And I think that we're gonna have many more entrepreneurs around the world, people like you, I think. So I think the world post COVID is, uh, we have been giving, I'm, I must say, I must say a qualification that of course, some countries have been really hit. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday with a group in Peru where you know, virtually people are dying, uh, and, you know, as you know, like in India, very difficult situation. So I'm not talking about the challenges that many countries are facing, but in general, I think that uh, it's accelerating some of the trends that have been uh, ongoing for the last 10, 20 years, you know, digital, global connectedness, uh, the whole planetary sustainability dimension, et cetera, et cetera. So I am uh, actually quite positive about the future. Thank you, Ariane. Thank you. And, and Hendrik, your thoughts? Yeah, I think just to add to what Marcelo said, I think they're you know, definitely seeing yeah, at an investment level, there's a, there's a strong sort of focus on, on driving a lot of the, the, the digital efforts and digital investments. You know, we've seen quite a number of industries, I think, um, sort of bring forward a lot of the digital and digital transformation initiatives and investments that they've had maybe you know, earmark maybe for a 36 month time frame, sort of you're down to maybe an 18 month time frame. Um, so I think a lot of industries are transforming digitally much faster than what they had in mind. Um, so it's not just the individuals, but also the sectors. Um, I think there's a unity aspect, which is probably not as prevalent now. And it, it's difficult to spot now, sort of given the fact that everybody is, is fighting over, you know, over the vaccines. But I think sort of post the, the current pandemic will probably see quite a lot of unity around the world in, in terms of how we need to tackle these kind of events going forward. Because I think it's most likely not the last pandemic that we're going to see in our lifetimes, um, which means that we need to be better prepared next time around that this thing um, you know, hits either particular regions or particular countries or even if a bit, again, sort of the entire world as it did this time around. So there will be an element, I think, where you know, the world will become a smaller place in many, many you know, aspects and respects in the way that we that we handle this. And I think just in general, there's going to be a reshuffling of priorities. You know, I think, um, and I think, um, you, know, you touched on it as well during our previous conversation around the, the, you know, the emotional health and the, the mental health of individuals are uh, definitely going to play a significantly stronger role you know, within the corporate environment in particular, yeah, you know, because of the fact that you know, under periods or extended periods of stress, um, yeah, you know, this becomes an, an exceptionally important element to address. Um, and I think you know, the fact that we are physically isolated from a lot of individuals, you know, during lockdown periods, etc., you know, obviously accentuates and, and increases the risk uh, of all the issues and challenges associated with mental health. So, you know, just a few thoughts. In addition to Marcelo, but it's the, the important thing, you know, and, and we, we've we've had a number of discussions sort of around this within the within the company as well. Is that you know it, we're building a new house. We're not we're not waiting for the old house to to kind of repair itself. We're not renovating, right? It's a it's a new world that we're kind of building post COVID. You know, it's it's not getting back to normal. It's not, and, and we hear a lot of 
you sort of business leaders and political leaders, you're talking about getting back to normal. And it's not really trying to get back to normal. It's about creating the new norm. It's about building the new house. It's about understanding how this new uh, sort of you know, world that we need to live in you know, will be more conducive uh, and more flexible and able to handle you know, the challenges you know, that we'll most likely need to, to face in the foreseeable future, you know, how it will be able to handle those things. And touching on that idea of construction and expansion of globalization, but a shrinking of the world, uh, you know, Hendrik, what do you think about preparedness? You know, are we ready for this new normal? And what do you think still needs to change before we can safely interact with each other again? I mean, the immediate focus is obviously it's the, it's the, um, it's the vaccine because I mean, you know, I think you based on the early figures that have been released, the vaccine definitely has a very positive impact on you know the level of infections and definitely the mortality rates as well. But I think yeah you know, that you know yeah there are a number of 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 decisions and policies and agreements that I think that we need to to talk about openly you know, across government and especially across regions like Africa because I mean we haven't been able to really sort of handle the pandemic in a particularly good way. You know, purely because the logistics infrastructure in Africa and the healthcare infrastructure is, you know, was particularly good to start with. Um, and the pandemic has obviously you know, put quite a sort of big spotlight on you know, the lack of healthcare infrastructure in general and the healthcare pr practitioners and the ability to reach remote places in Africa um, you know, during the pandemic. But you know, I think this time around, you know, because we were caught off guard, I mean, the only person that was really kind of flying the flag really really hard was was Bill Gates a few years ago and everybody thought he was a bit of a nutter when he got on, on the stage and at TED and, and started um, sort of talking about the the apocalypse, you know, the virus. That's probably going to, to upset the world in the foreseeable future. But you know, we took quite a blunt instrument to a very complex problem. And we we allowed our economies to come to a complete standstill because we did not take a let's say a scalpel approach you know, to the, the current issue. So as opposed to really trying to figure out which parts of our communities and which parts of the population are really at risk, you know, we brought a lot of the African economies in any case, literally you know, to their knees. And we don't know to what degree, you know, the socioeconomic impact uh, is going to have a longer term um, you know, effect on some of the African economies you know, because of, of a lot of the globalization drive that to a large degree has has reduced quite significantly because I mean, when you are investing in a developing region, you, you typically want to travel there. You know, you don't want to invest in Ghana if you've never visited Ghana or you've never visited West Africa for that matter. You know, so Africa is, is very much dependent on physical travel moving, um, you know, people going into the region and experiencing, sitting down with the investors and the partners and the, and the clients, et cetera, et cetera. And so in order for us to kind of prepare for, you know, then, that globalization to, to get back on track to a large degree. Um, I think we're gonna to have to, to figure out you know, how we're going to handle these kind of situations going forward. So I think there will be a hesitation just to do things as per normal going forward because a lot of people lost a lot of money, I think, in past, as part of that process because the, the whole expansion game from a geographic perspective in any case, a lot of these initiatives were just put on ice you know, because of, of the COVID pandemic. And Marcelo, if I could, uh, if we could turn a, a, a bit of a corner and, and think, you know, if we're talking business and we're, we're talking, you know, the, the loss of money that pe some people have experienced, keeping in mind as well, the loss of life, uh, and this uh, short-term reduction of opportunities. Marcelo, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, I, I guess we could all say that companies are in survival mode. But what are some of the innovations that you're seeing as companies attempt to navigate the pandemic and, and this, you know, situation that we're currently in? Yeah, so I, I think that um, it's like, in a way, there's like a bifurcation. It's like there are two worlds now. One world is uh, the tech world, you know, the, the you know, Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, and many other, you know, in their ecosystem. Uh, they have actually benefited tremendously from the crisis. So you can see their evaluation, their sales, 
uh, exploding. So the whole area around uh, the digital world platforms, uh, you know, from you know Deliveroo's to all these new platforms, they are uh, exponentially growing. And then there is a whole world of say uh, the more kind of physical companies that deliver products. Some products, and not all of them, obviously connected to travel, tourism, also hospitality. Of course, they have suffered tremendously. Many of these small businesses, more family businesses. So there is a real bifurcation. I think whether you see the innovation is definitely around the, the IT, digitalization, apps, you know, basically companies becoming digital in everything they do. That's one big, uh, you know, area of innovation that really touches everybody, or I think potentially everybody could benefit from it. You know, you can have, you know, as you know, you know, you have companies that pop up from anywhere around the world and within months or weeks or years, they can become global companies. So this is quite unique in the history of uh, economic history. The second big set of trends is around the, the planetary dimension, sustainability, uh, climate change, um, uh, natural resources, the way we we need to be able to manage those in a, in a way that is much more sustainable. And that's also, uh, in your answer to your question, a lot of innovations going on there, you know, from large companies setting up uh, huge coalitions of suppliers like Unilever, I think two or three days ago together with Google, they kind of map all the supply chains using Google Maps, etc. How do you use this amazing technology, which I think we've only seen the beginning of, and apply to uh, preserving and, and regenerating our planet and the resources that, uh, that, well, that we have used up and that we need if you wanted to continue growing. And then the final thing I want to say is that uh, clearly in our country, and some of you are from China, I mean, you, you've seen China has grown 18% in the first quarter of 2021, you know. So many countries have actually been very successful in, in uh, combating the crisis and coming out stronger. Uh, so that's, it's very important because it, it points to uh, often good government or very effective government, you know, South Korea, Taiwan, China, they actually been much better than many other countries. Uh, and the final thing I want to say is that there is a kind of a geographical shift uh, of the world toward the East. You know, we have known this for 20 years, but now it's really happening with, you know, China, Asia, and of course, India as well. Um, so the world, you know, I would say not what, uh, you know, Friedman said, the earth is flat. The earth is not flat, you know, there's lots of diversity and differences in the world. And, you know, picking up on that point, there's some activity that is happening in the chat. Uh, and and I, I would like to um, pose this comment to you first, Hendrik, uh, before we, we um, touch on Marcelo for, for his thoughts. But uh, there's this idea that it's going to exacerbate um, the, the difference, the, the gap between the rich and the poor. And the question was, you know, how do you think we need to balance that as we have some countries that are much more prepared for the acceleration of the technological upgrading of ent enterprises, digitalization, transformation, so on and so forth. How do we balance that? How, how can we um, shorten that gap between, between the rich and the poor? I may I just have a quick go? Uh, so I, I'm really passionate about this subject. Um, well, quickly. First of all, I think that, uh, again, going back to China or Taiwan or South Korea, by the way, we have quite a few B Corps in those countries. I've been there a number of times. You had a very effective government in terms of education, in terms of providing skills for young people. Uh, and, you know, again, not wanting to diminish any country, but last night in this call with Peru, you know, Peru is completely the opposite. They kind of blown it, you know, it's like Venezuela, you know, they haven't invested anything in people and their education. So what, what the ecosystem and the framework of which government is part, what they have done and what they're doing is fundamental to ensure that we have fewer inequalities and we give people more life chances uh, everywhere. Thank you, yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things come to mind, I think, just with the glasses of trying to mitigate that, because, I mean, and especially in the digital space, yeah, and, and we, we, we draw comparisons sometimes between the digital environment and, and the, the capital-intensive environment, yeah, where 
investments has got a tendency of flowing where you've got good quality uh, policy in, in, and the enforceability of policy. Um, and the reason why it's so important in the digital space in particular is that if you don't create, so for instance, in innovation sandbox environments. So we recently did a, uh, a project on FinTech within Africa, which we took a look at four different um, countries in Africa, took a look at South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. And we took a look at their advancements in the financial technology space. Yeah, and the importance of, of the quality and the enforceability of, of policy was really important in order to, to try to advance some of these technologies and development in fintech. For the simple reason that the, the you know, elements and, and components in the policy, like so for instance, the sandbox environment where they can, uh, they are allowed to operate at a limited level um, you know, with the intention of testing some of the products and services without having to go through the entire registration process typically associated with a full scale you know, financial service registration, which can take up to two years and obviously burns a lot of cash you know, for a startup is really important. Um, you know, so we've got a tendency in Africa and a tendency in some of the developing regions around the world where the legislators and the policymakers are quite comfortable being two steps behind the curve. So they take a look at what happens elsewhere in the world and then they just adjust the policy environments in order to kind of you take a look at what at how things are going to pan out at local level, which is not good enough anymore. If we don't want the gap to widen between the rich and the poor, if we do not want Africa to stay behind from a digital perspective, it's not necessarily, it doesn't really have anything to do with COVID. It really has a lot to do with the way that we approach the investments that we make, you know, the quality and the enforceability of the policies that we put in place you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, we work on a regular basis with a wide variety of industries, anything from capital intensive like energy, um, you know, to the digital industries, you know, to financial services, and we deal with public sector. And where you see your know, good quality policy and where you see those policies being, you know, applied properly and enforced properly in Africa, you see a significant amount of investment flow in the medium to long term. So in order to do that, in order to support the, the digitization and digital transformation processes you know, associated with typically more flexible operating models and business models, which is required in the future. And I think sort of going back to your previous question around you know, what are some of the important aspects that need to be taken into account and, and how do we prepare ourselves? You know, the businesses you know, that, that weren't flexible, you were hit the hardest. You know, the, one of the aspects of the tourism industry that's really tough is the fact that you need to book, say, for instance, your big holiday six months in advance. And changing and chopping it is really difficult. And that's why people aren't booking six months in advance holidays at the moment, because you can't change it. You know, there are a number of other industries that we can think of in terms of examples where they are very inflexible in the way that they operate and the way that they they invest, you know, which means it's very difficult for them to adjust within an environment where, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in three months time. You don't know if you're going to be able to travel out there or do the investment or you conclude the deal or you progress a particular initiative, you know, based on where the environment is at. You don't know how what your staff complement is going to look like. You know, so locking yourself into a five-year deal at the moment is not a particularly wise thing to do. So, you know, the platform-based services, the ability to scale up, scale down, everything as a service, you know, those kind of businesses, you know, we'll see, um, will do really, really well over the foreseeable future. Those businesses with the ability to absorb, you know, some of the risks charge for it. So you charge a premium, but you allow the next link and the supply chain and the value chain to be more flexible. Those are the businesses that we think you know, will do particularly well in the so-called new norm. So, you know, in the, in the new house, as we said, probably speaking at the beginning of the conversation. So from these few minutes that we've been talking, we've certainly identified that you know, innovation, different ways of thinking, being flexible, digitalization you know, are all key to making sure that our, our new normal, whatever that ends up being, is going to be successful for everyone and can be applied to shorten gaps and, and inequalities. But when we think about you know, technology and innovation and digitalization, we also think data. And we have a question here from Augustine who says, you know, and particularly focusing on that inequality dimension, 
that there is a huge shortage of accurate data from the emerging economies, particularly India. So other measurements uh, that we're uh, receiving at the moment really providing a realistic picture on the, the context? So I'll, I'll give it a go because I'm, I, I'm, and I'm no expert on India, but I can give you a view on Africa. And I know that there are quite a number of parallels are quite often um, drawn between India and between Africa. Um, and it's not me drawing those, those are some of my Indian colleagues that work with me on the African continent that quite often draw uh, sort of parallels between sort of what some of the challenges that we face on the continent and, and you know, what they face on, in India. And you're 100% correct in that the quality of the information that we have available to us is not particularly good. So we second guess all the information that we obtain from a secondary perspective, even if it does come, you know, from official government sources, um, your customs data, et cetera, et cetera. We always cross-reference those with two or three different methodologies, either model figures or you know, extracted through primary research or whatever the case in order to build our growth strategies. Um, you know, so I can tell you that the the I mean the numbers uh, for COVID, let's say north of South Africa in any case. You would definitely be significantly underquoted because, I mean, you know, the vast majority of rural Africa has got no way of reporting those figures. And I spoke to um, one of my Indian colleagues um, two days ago, actually, um, actually on Friday. So it was a Friday afternoon that I spoke to him and he was saying 50%. You know, they're underquoting you know, the figures and the mortality rates but by typically by 50% and, and anybody coming from from um, from India will, will most likely concur that the numbers are being significantly underreported. Um, and big data at this stage is not it's not the solution, right? So I mean we we ran trials with big data and artificial intelligence in Africa quite extensively over the last two years in order to figure out you know, whether it's good enough in order to plug some of the gaps in, in information. But you know the gaps are too big. You know then you know the the running artificial intelligence on on baseline data um, sources in Africa, yeah, you know, wasn't particularly useful. It, it was useful taking a look at things like perception, perception changes, etc. Um, yeah, you know, but at this stage, it's just way too far off the mark in order to be able to extract useful insights out of it for the majority of industries. And I'm, I'm generalizing, I mean, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, you yeah, but that's what we've what we've got to work with. Um, and there's no short term solution to that. I mean, there's there's only the the longer term you know, options, whereas there is a certain amount of physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure that needs to be invested in in order to make sure that we extract better quality data from, from on the ground, you know, from rural areas and from urban areas across developing regions. So I want to add, um, I mean, absolutely, Ariane, uh, having good data is so critically important uh, for, the, for, for governments, for entrepreneurs uh, at all levels. But there is a but. And maybe for you, uh, if you're interested, um, a friend of mine, John Naisbit, wrote a book called Mega Trends. This is already 20 years ago. So if, you, if you're interested. And in Mega Trends, he talks about the long term um, shifts and waves, waves, you know, changes, transformation that go on in the world. And, you know, as, as I, we're speaking together with many of you doing your MBAs it's very clear that we've never had so much know-how in the world as we have now you know all of you are very well educated uh, you had the uh, privilege uh, or maybe of course you work very hard to be able to be studying now you you will be fully prepared to uh, to start your lives or to continue your working lives uh, with tremendous know-how with basically you can be connected with anyone around the world and this is a very important mega trend together with this entrepreneurship. I think all around the world, and you know, uh, I love the story of Jack Ma. You know, Jack Ma, you know, Jack Ma, you know, he, he tried nine times to get the job and it was always never, he, he always failed. And then he started, you know, Alibaba and see where, we, where he is. So this is a world where uh, many Jack Ma's can be produced, can be made. Uh, and actually, I am very much. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm in favor of billionaires, but I'm very in favor of successful entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think there is incredible opportunities for people like Jack Ma in the world. I would only say uh, that I am calling for some sort of a stewardship um, criteria where people who do make all these billions 
also share them. Uh, I don't mean share them, give them away, but invest them back in, into society. We have a very successful impact investing uh, movement. I've been part of it for 20 years or so. You know, started with uh, microfinance and now with impact investing. So basically, you can invest. If you have billions, you can invest them back into schools, hospital, you know, education for everybody. So it's a really win-win. And I, I'm puzzling as to why governments haven't uh, created incentives for people to do that, because it would be a fantastic. I think Singapore actually has an incentive. If you invest in impact, the government puts nearly 100% back, depending on the case, but they kind of double your money, basically. So we need to have more smart solutions from government to do that and encourage that kind of good entrepreneurship. Uh, I think if, if I can maybe add to Marcelo, which I, and, and I agree with everything that he said, I mean, entrepreneurship to a large degree is the answer to a lot of developing regions problems, you know, especially in places like Africa. Systematic job creation went into the squads for us. It, it won't create or have a, a you know, we, we won't make a dent in, you know, the unemployment figures you know, in Africa, you know, through structural job creation or through investments from government, et cetera. It, it's entrepreneurship that will ultimately you know, lift the continent out of, out of poverty. The other end of the spectrum and having worked in, in developed market also for a significant portion of my career is that you know, the highly developed market is also very difficult to be an entrepreneur because I mean, there are so many rules and regulations you've got to adhere to. It's very difficult to actually you know, be an entrepreneur unless you're a corporate entrepreneur and you're somebody sitting within a larger corporate and innovating you know, within that corporate, which brings a different set of challenges, but you know, let's leave that be for now. But you know, the COVID pandemic has opened up the door you know, for entrepreneurship in quite a significant way. And it's one of the positive spin-offs that we'll definitely see coming out of this whole process is, you know, necessity is, is you know, going to drive people to innovation. And, it, and it's a fact. I mean, you know, every single time we see a significant event like this, you will see a significant amount of innovation flow from it. And Africa is full of it, right? So, I mean, we, every single time we see a significant challenge you know, from a commercial or a social uh, perspective, you do see a significant amount of innovation flowing from it. And I don't think COVID is going to be anything, anything, um, any different. Um, the key thing for us is just that in, in places like Africa, you know, people need more support in order to, to be able to be entrepreneurs. They need microfinancing. You know, they need the legislative environment to support them. Yeah, you know, they need training. You know, basic finance skills. And, and we're talking. We don't. You know, in regions like Africa, for some reason, there's a there's this fixation on um, university level qualifications, on on degrees and, and formal degrees, etc., as opposed to vocational training. And and I and I completely understand and agree that you know university level qualifications, there's a place for it. You know, and there's it's important you know, to look after that part of of education as well. But it's a pretty small component compared to what we require actually on the ground, which is more vocational training around basic business skills, around entrepreneurial skills, about spotting opportunities, about you know, basic, basic, basic skills that we require in order to be able to empower people in order to look after themselves and their families. And we see that. I mean, if we travel across the region, you know, the urban areas is one thing, but as soon as you move slightly outside of the urban areas, I mean, you see the requirement. And it's not it's not because of a lack of, of wanting or lack of need. or you know, it's, it's sometimes just because of a lack of exposure. Um, you know, and I think there, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, again, for us you know, in the post-COVID environment, you need know, to take advantage of, of the situation in a good way, you know, to be able to up you know, the focus on entrepreneurship you know, and use it to our advantage in places like Africa. You know, get the policy environment to support some of the initiatives and where we want to drive you know, our economies to. Um, you know, use the opportunity to, to drive the digital economies. You know, use the opportunity to harvest more data. You know, I mean, Africa is, is, is a classic example where we, as a continent, we've exported our raw materials um, without beneficiating it now for decades. You know, which has been an absolute shame because Africa doesn't get the advantage necessarily, uh, despite the fact that it's endowed with so much wealth. And unfortunately, if we continue along the road that, we, that we're traveling at the moment, we're going to do the same with data, which is, which is the new gold. And I said, we need to figure out so how do we use the data and the information that we are gathering in Africa, for Africa, you know, as a region. And while we are on the subject of, you know, the future of work and the future of the labour force, 
uh, with the COVID-19 induced disruptions, changing the business and social landscapes, technology and you know, automation has gained precedence. What do you think the job market will be in five to 10 years with organizations increasing the use of uh, automation? And I'll, I'll ask this to you both because I, I would love to hear the perspective from, uh, you know, fr from the African point of view, but also from the European point of view. So uh, I'm gonna, just enough for all of you to know, I, uh, my last big projects creating the B Corps, we have 4,000 B Corps in 75 countries. So uh, I get a lot of data from all around the world, you know, on a daily basis. And I see that there are some similar trends uh, all around. So one is uh, clearly um, you need certain specific skills, like, you know, maybe programming, understanding computers and you know, IT and something stuff that maybe I didn't study formally at university when I was, uh, you know, young. But I think it's really important to do those. Uh, and, you know, there are all kinds of obviously outside of university, you know, Coursera, Khan Academy, you can do program on these things everywhere. So very important. Secondly, you know, I said it earlier, is the entrepreneurship. You know, uh, when, when someone, and being an entrepreneur, it's interesting. If you can start small, you can uh, grow over time, but the, the actual mindset and the skills of an entrepreneur can be transported to many other sectors. So if you are a success, successful entrepreneur in one sector, you have a much better chance of succeeding in another sector. So and these are things you carry with you. So uh, uh, I think that for all of you doing your MBAs, uh, some of you may already be entrepreneurs, but otherwise I would encourage, you know, or be an intrapreneur within your company, because those entrepreneurial skills will be able to, will allow you to navigate whatever uh, changes will come in the future. We don't know, Ariana, we don't know to what extent this uh, combination of robotics, IT, digitalization, uh, will it really um, be totally disruptive? And as some people say, you know, uh, only a few people will work and reap all the profit and everyone else will be unemployed. I don't think it will be so far, it will go as far as that, but I think you have to watch it. And also a lot of these things, will evolve depending on what we do. What actions do we take now? You know, I, I'm part of an in initiative here in the Netherlands. A lot of companies are actually working hard to make sure that uh, young people will have jobs and with training, with internships, uh, you know, the, the German model of apprenticeships, so or you get enough training to be able to uh, enter the corporate uh, ladder and stay in there. You know? So there are things that we can do. Um, so. I don't need to summarize, but I think it's clear, it, you know, these sort of skills, programming, IT, and then entrepreneurship, uh, absolutely essential. And I think the flexibility element there, right? So I think it's one of the things where, you know, the chances of you sticking to the same job, and we said this for obviously for a long period of time, but I mean, the, the chance of you sticking to the same job for a long period of time is pretty slim. You are going to have to be able to change you know, quite a number of times, most likely sort of between different careers, you know, so you need to make sure that the skill set and the qualifications are of such that you don't rabbit hole yourself for too long period of time. Um, you know, I think your companies in general are going to, to look at a significantly larger proportion of, of their staff complement being flexible. Yeah, in order to make sure that they can actually, um, you remain more flexible within times of turmoil, you know, as we've seen in the, um, in the current sort of environment where yeah, a good 30, 40% of the staff will be based on contracts. You know, they won't necessarily be based on, on permanent employee uh, basis, um, which means that, that you know, the flexible part of, of uh, the employee base will need to make sure that they focus very strongly on skills uh, and experience that they'll be able to sell and resell you to other organizations, companies that they can actually um, sort of work uh, or carry across from the one organization to the next. Um, and some of the fields that we definitely see a significant amount of changes, I think, in the short to medium term would be areas like HR. You know, the, the re human resource management field in the next two to five years you know, will change significantly because there's a whole new killer fish. You know, it's, it's a whole new ball, ball game. You're trying to manage employee well being and productivity 
and you know, team spirit and teamwork and, and inducing values, et cetera, if a very significant proportion of the workforce is working remotely. Um, and you, if you do implement sort of you know, more flexible um, sort of working practices, you're part of the time you work from home, you're part of the time you work from an office, it can be the one office or the next office, et cetera, et cetera. The next field is obviously the marketing field, you know, which will also you know, be very, very strongly influenced, I think, by, by COVID because I mean, a lot of the industries have relied on face-to-face -face interaction, conferences, um, the financial industry sort of in-bank experience. The banks you know, tried for a number of years trying to get all the customers out of the banks in order to save you know, on some of the uh, the physical need to work costs and then they realize they don't have an opportunity to, to market it to them and then they try to get them back into the physical infrastructure and now you know, nobody can attend the physical infrastructure. So everybody tried to move into digital marketing and most of the companies did a pretty clumsy job of, of moving from physical marketing to digital marketing. So the traditional channels on, you know, they're not there anymore, you know, so you guys are probably the same. You get these very strange unsolicited emails and, and messages on LinkedIn from people that, you know, completely outside of your industry with un, you know, with products and services, you know, that are completely irrelevant as opposed to taking a, a really good, strong content-led focus and understanding sort of, you know, the, the customer base in order to you know, pitch something as relevant, you know, at the relevant platforms, et cetera. So the marketing field, I think, is going to change quite significantly, and the supply chain, obviously, will also change quite significantly. I think that you know the key thing is not necessarily focusing on one particular element, but making sure that the skill sets are transferable from one company to the next. Yeah, I mean, may I add one quick thing? I, I think that, uh, uh, there's also it's part of my work around uh, the sustainability, natural resources management. Uh, that's also a very important area, you know, from water to energy. So uh, I would advise people to um, become quite familiar with the whole, uh, you know, this this the UN as the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. What those are, and how can you, as a corporate leader or entrepreneur, uh, be at least familiar with them. Uh, it's connected with the, what everyone is asking for companies to have more impact, positive impact on the world. So also know what what is positive impact uh, uh, through through your company. Um, those are very important uh, because you know if you look at China, India, everywhere. But in a way, the, the faster a country is going, like China, the more you have this. Uh, exponential pressure on natural resources and therefore the more you have to know how do you cope with with this new reality so this is a very important reality and it is also a source of huge innovation and investments this i think uh, the latest figures show like 13 trillion dollars a year needed to beat the sdgs in the next 10 years so and this is what means more and more banks and investors are putting money into these sectors so many companies are just looking for that kind of money to grow new businesses, become actually startups, even if they're already established businesses. So it goes together with this entrepreneurship, startup, uh, being an entrepreneur inside a company, uh, and the realities of uh, a, a small planet where we have used a lot of the resources and we need to regenerate them. Now, something that you've both touched upon that I'm going to circle back to because of a, a question that has come through the chat. When we look at finance markets, when we look at banking, uh, is there a possibility that digital currencies, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ripple will reshape the overall digital economy, economy in the next five to 10 years? Sounds like people are asking for advice on the Bitcoin that they've <laughs> just recently purchased. Um, I've, I've got quite strong views I think, on, on, on cryptocurrencies because um, we, I mean, we've been tracking it for quite a long period of time. It's for us, both from a consulting and from a research perspective. Now, um, I've got no doubt in my mind that cryptocurrencies are the way of the future. You know, there's no, I mean, most of our currencies in any case are digital. I mean, it's not based on the gold standard for a long period of time. You know, it's mainly digital, you know, but the, the challenge that we have is because of the lack of adoption of cryptocurrencies, it's very volatile. You know, so it, it's not a currency that you can use for trade purposes because you've got no idea what the valuation is going to be in, a, in you know, one week's time, what not three months or one year down the line. So up until the point that you've got significant 
trade volume. So i.e. you have countries moving over to, to digital currencies and yet to create that level of stability, it won't serve as a base currency for trade. But I do believe that it is the way of the future. Um, there's no ways that you know the current currency systems can sustain things over the long term. And there are, there are concerns about energy and there are concerns about processing power, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, none of those concerns are bigger you know, than what we faced from a processing perspective, et cetera, a few years ago. And we managed to solve those relatively easily just based on technological advancements in you know, five to 10 years. So those will solve. You know, the stability element, in my view, is the biggest element that needs solving. And we'll only get to that point once we've had, um, once we've reached the threshold of significant enough trade in order to create that stability. Because at the moment, it's speculation, it's gambling. You know, it's, and I understand that more people are investing in it. I understand that there are significantly more trade volumes and the fund that was just created in order to you know, provide people access to it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still, to a large degree, um, your gambling is very volatile. No, I, I want to add that uh, I agree with Hendrik uh, that one really needs to also keep an eye on the real economy. Because the real economy, it, it, and I think there is a real, uh, well, there is a, also a shift going on towards more services, with more well-being, you know, of course, in some parts of the world population are aging, you know, even in China and India, but certainly China. Uh, so there is uh, lots of industries uh, growing around the well-being of people, which is less material stuff and more services and digital, etc. Uh, and I would keep an eye on, uh, you know, like you, someone put it in the chat, you know, what's happening now in, in the US with this, uh, all these trillions being invested in infrastructure. Um, what are governments doing to encourage the, uh, you know, all the recovery funds around the world? Where is their money going? Uh, what are the opportunities for businesses uh, to actually use some of that money for, for growing uh, sometimes new sectors, sometimes uh, disrupting existing, uh, existing businesses and business models as well. Business models are very important. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the idea of a circular economy. Uh, we have one of the leading companies in the world is Philips, which is a Dutch company. Philips is very advanced on circularity. That basically means instead of selling a light, you, you know, a physical light, you sell the use of energy. So that going away from, from ownership to use, that's also another big trend. So there are uh, quite a lot of these things uh, that are really creating a new normal, I think, as Ariana or Hendrik was saying earlier. But the real economy, so the, I agree with the, uh, the power of these digital currencies, but like what happened with the SPACs, you know, the special vehicles that have been set up, SPACs, after a boom, now, now they're kind of going down and the value is diminishing because the, you have to always root back in the real economy. Otherwise, it becomes a kind of abstract thing where, well, actually, you can lose your shirt, you know? So I've, I've got a bet with a number of my colleagues, you know, for real money, that um, it's going to be an African government sort of signing up for the first cryptocurrency or, or converging to a cryptocurrency because of the fact that a lot of the African economies are so small. You know, they're, the challenge with, with that is that you know, quite a lot of times the currencies get speculated on by some of the larger banks. I mean, even the South African RAND, you know, was a victim of that a few years ago where one of the investment banks you know, was, was playing with it, where they, they were toying with it on the global market and making it move up and down in order to capitalize on it. And it's the second largest economy in the region. So you can imagine some of the smaller economies it being quite a significant risk. So I've, I've got a little bit going on the side saying like it's going to be one of the African economies taking on a digital currency first. And we're going to move from there. But anyway, it's, um, that's just a sidebar. Will it be Rwanda, next? Andrew? Will it be Rwanda? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it's Rwanda, to be honest. I mean, given, given the amount of investment he's putting into the digital economy and that new um, sort of massive center that he just put up that I think is almost done. Um, I mean, they're quite advanced as well. I mean, Rwanda pulled, uh, yeah, um, Uganda pulled back a bit. So they were quite advanced, but I mean, they opened up the gate too much. So they had to sort of relook at their 
uh, regulatory environment. So they've, they've, they're a bit more conservative at the moment. So I think um, Kagame is crazy enough for them to do something like that, if you ask me. There you go, folks. You heard it here first. So keep an eye on, on that corner of the world. And who knows, maybe you can put a few cryptocurrency dollars or ripple into the, the kitty and, and you might be able to make a, a, a winning out of it. And also looking at the chat, um, Augustine and I are both curious about uh, a, a very similar topic, which is uh, the business generations within the, the workplace. And, and I direct my question to you, Marcelo, you know, is there, um, you know, does this current move towards digitalization or indeed the pandemic itself with the move from working from home and the need to embrace technology and Zoom and so on and so forth, do you think that there is a disproportionate challenge or, or benefit perhaps to uh, some of the generational groups? And what do you think the outcome of this will be for the future of work? So I, I made a few notes uh, uh, and I'm gonna just pick them up here. Um, uh, so two things, one is, um, I, I was lucky, I, was, I also spent a year and a half at Stanford. Uh, my eldest son is a startup entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Uh, I feel like, you know, I'm still the 20 year old guy who started a company. So I am very close to young people in that sense. And I think that the, the world, you know, the world in Silicon Valley kind of stops when you're 40, you know? I mean, like, you know, everyone seems to be 25. So I'm really, the power of youth is fantastically important. Uh, secondly, uh, I think that uh, when you have the magic combination of enough finance, like you have in Sweden, for example, in Germany, uh, a lot of, obviously Silicon Valley is still the number one, but outside of Silicon Valley, we've seen a lot of successes in Sweden. Sweden, maybe in 20 years, most of the companies that are successful are different than they were 20 years ago. So the, the power of youth, innovation, and money, when you can get it to work right, is fantastic. You know? uh, so on your question, Ariane, uh, I think actually that those people, those younger people who are able to um, act entrepreneurially and create disruptive companies of the future, they're definitely going to have an advantage, no question about it. So there's certainly no penalty on them. Uh, the the pen penalty is unfortunately on those younger people who have not had the benefit of a good education or they, they live in countries where the government has not done what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, so, and so they lack those skills to be able to be entrepreneurs in the global world. And it is very sad but to counteract that. I think that uh, there's also one of your other questions you, you asked me is, I think there is a lot of new um, global awareness and consciousness. If you look at you know the billionaires and the sort of philanthropic capitalism, uh, how much these people are doing in a way for the benefit of the world. You know, you've seen it maybe yesterday, day before yesterday, the CEO of Google and uh, what's the other one, Microsoft, both Indian born. They've come out supporting uh, India and what's happening in India with the vaccine. So there is a lot going on. Many of these wealthy entrepreneurs are giving back and investing in society. And there are all kinds of educational programs run by, you know, with US money, with European money, supporting uh, the training and the development of uh, young people in, in countries that they've been less fortunate. Uh, final thing I want to say is there is a, um, also maybe a, a, not a counter trend, but it's also happening that people uh, retire earlier in their fifties and uh, they start set up companies. In fact, if you look at the age of startups, it isn't that low actually, it's like 43, 44, because there are a lot of people who after a successful career in industry, now they can create their own businesses. So there is also that, you know, and Warren Buffett, you know Warren Buffett, he invested in a company run by a lady who was 84 she was a fantastic furniture, a furniture store in Nebraska, and he made a lot of money out of it. And that lady worked until she was 96. So you also see that happening. Uh, so uh, I don't know, Ariane, whether there is any penalty for anyone. I think that if you are smart enough and capable enough, and you can use the, the digital tools we have, in a way, that is the real power today. 
And I certainly think, you know, the, the onus is also back on the individual as well. Um, you know, the, there is certainly that ability to, you know, with all of these tools and, and learning platforms that are available for people to, you know, be able to take the time uh, and, and take the course and, and re-educate. And there, there is no age limit on that. That is always something that you're, you're able to do. But speaking about platforms, Hendrik, a, a question for you. I mean, we've seen this launch of um, the teletherapy, telehealth, you know, all focused on, on mental health and getting mental health to people despite distances. And you know, it's brought into um, compliance issues in, into light with HIPAA for that HIPAA uh, platforms. If we can just take a, a little bit of a turn for a moment, um, do you foresee you know, regulation changing and people getting the help that they need and that these platforms will become much more prevalent and ubiquitous? I think so. Um, I think the priorities within, within corporates and organizations are beginning to change from, a, from, you know, from an HR, from a healthcare perspective, right? Because I think, you know, it's one thing I think that that COVID also did, which is positive, is is emphasise the importance of mental health in the workplace. Um, and and I think there are two important things. One is corporates need to, on the one side, pay more attention to it because I mean one of the challenges that that corporates find, and and you know, in the previous life, I used to build these large sort of innovation platforms. You know, for corporates taking a look at new business opportunities and things and new initiatives that they want to take on board in order to build related business opportunities and new ideas, etc. And one of the big challenges of getting any new idea through the corporate governance structures is the link between investment and return. It's got to be very clear before any corporate whips out a significant amount of funds. And the challenge in the HR field in general is that that link is quite often a bit thin, it's a bit tedious. It's, it's not clear what the impact is going to be based on particular types of investment that you make. And that investment is necessarily going to stick around for the next 36 months or next, next five years, whatever the case may be. So governments are going to have to do the necessary in order to make sure that the platforms are in place and that the legislation or the legislative environment supports um, you know, the digital environment again, so i.e. being two steps ahead of the game as opposed to two steps behind, corporates are going to have to, to, to come to the table in order to make sure that they take a broader view to leadership and to management. And then I think very importantly, the employees need to take up the responsibility of managing themselves as well. You know, what we've, we've seen, and, and we being sort of, I guess the, the consulting environment is quite we got fortunate and we, we kind of sit slightly outside of the operations a bit. And, and you know, for all practical purposes, we don't choose a side. It's not the corporate that's right and the employee is wrong or the employee is always right and the corporate is always wrong. The intention is to make sure that you know, the business succeeds at the end of the day and the business needs you know, a good workforce and the workforce needs a, a responsible employer longer term in order to, to make sure that that relationship is, is conducive for both parties longer term. You know, just making the platforms available doesn't work. The employees also need to take responsibility for their own health. So I think there's an education element that needs to happen you know, at employee level in order to make sure that they understand that they should take responsibility for it, how they take responsibility for it. There needs to be a, an increased level of awareness uh, when it comes to mental health. And then corporates need to make sure that those platforms are available, you know, and it's destigmatized. Um, yeah, and there are a significant amount of problems associated with dealing with individuals with mental health issues. You know, once they you know, pass certain thresholds, you're know, trying to you know, pull them back is, is really challenging, you know, and that, that's real investment in return, you know, that you can prove, you know, from a healthcare perspective right there. You know, so corporates need to, to obviously sort of come to the table, I think, with a whole lot more than what, what they're doing at the moment. And like I said, I mean, the isolation, I think the, you know, the level of conference calls that we've got to take, we're all zoomed out a bit, right? So there's there's a different type of fatigue that we're feeling and that we're experiencing at the moment. 
So I think there are multiple stakeholders that essentially need to come to the table in order to make sure that we address this thing in, a, in the broader sense. And I don't want to use the word holistic because I think it's a bit overused and it, 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 there's certain sort of, there's a stigma attached to it, but let's just say a, a broader understanding and a broader approach that we need to, that we need to take. Wonderful, thank you. Now I do, uh, I am aware that we have gone just slightly over. So in these last few minutes, uh, I would like to open the floor to the students um, to see if anyone was brave enough to perhaps unmute themselves and, and ask directly um, before perhaps I, I close the session. Did anyone have any burning questions that they'd like to jump in and ask? Okay, so perhaps uh, just as some final comments uh, from the two of you before I let you um, carry on with your day. Um, from this current situation, you know, what is the, the really good news? What, what can both of you uh, comment on that will close this session and, and make us all feel positive about what is to come? So I, I, I go back to this first question of, uh, so this is, by the way, for you, who, those of you who are interested, Clayton Christensen, very uh, distinguished uh, HVS professor. He wrote several books on disruptive innovation. In a way, he is the kind of father of disruptive innovation, at least in theory. And his last book I mentioned is, how do you measure your life? So I go back to that first question is, uh, and some of you have uh, written beautiful statements on your chat uh, about this combination of entrepreneurship, innovation, fantastic. That's how humanity has progressed over time. You know? Without entrepreneurs, I say, we will still be eating with our hands and sitting in caves. You know? So entrepreneurship in a way is everything, but in which sense, in which direction? So where do you take this entrepreneurship? And this is the, the, uh, the, the chance we have now, as many of you will know, the UN has declared this the decade of action, the next 10 years, if you wanna save the planet and save the human race, maybe we don't go as far as being so apocalyptic, but uh, the serious challenges. So how do we use the in human innovation to create uh, a prosperous and beautiful planet for all of us? So I, I leave it like that. I think there's, for me at least, you know, I think I think the next 10 years, I know what I'm going to be doing, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Hendrik. I think I want to sort of, I guess, sort of just emphasize two points. I think the first point is, is quite functional and that you know, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that we've got to keep in mind is that, you know, very different to a world war, um, we have not destroyed the underlying infrastructure associated with um, our supply chain and our manufacturing, our infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And yet a lot of the underlying fundamentals of our economies are still very good. Hence, you know, as soon as we've seen, you know, the lockdowns ending, you know, we've seen typically, we've seen a lot of V-shaped recoveries from some of the economies, you know, much, much better than what the majority of the economists and, you know, both of us, sort of Marcelo and, my, and, and myself, have got strong sort of econometric backgrounds. Um, so I guess we can throw we can throw stones a bit. Um, you know, but a lot of economists have have, have said, look, it's going to be U-shaped and W shaped and, and includes what what else shaped. You know, but the underlying fundamentals of a lot of economies are, are still very good. It's not like we are destroying a lot of the underlying fundamentals. Yes, certain industries will definitely suffer and are still suffering and will suffer going forward. You know, but I mean, we will see a lot of industry balancing back you know, fairly quickly, I think, which is the first point. And the second point is, I don't think we should underestimate, you know, people's ability to respond to the crisis with very innovative um, and entrepreneurial thinking and solutions. Um, you know, we've seen amazing things happen uh, around the world and how people have delivered products and services in a more innovative and more flexible way, adjusting and, and you know, you're with the times. Um, and I think it, we are in for a, a very interesting um, and colorful sort of immediate future when it comes to sort of making sure that the, the new products and services that we deliver 
are going to be more flexible and they're going to be platform based. We're going to see a lot of everything as a service models coming up. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to benefit from it. Um, I think the current generation is is you coming out of universities are under an immense amount of pressure. And I've got a big appreciation for what um, you know the current graduates are going through. I mean, we are opening up um, you know, a lot of internship programs at Frost as well in order to take a look at whether we can provide a lot of people with, with work experience at least uh, so that they can use their, their time effectively. So it, it is a tough time, you know, but I mean, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's not going to stay like this all the time. You know, the motto is always outlearn the competition, right? So, you know, keep on learning, keep on figuring out sort of where the, the opportunities are. You know, take a look at what the medium term prospects are, you know, for particular, um, for particular functions, jobs, industries, uh, and take a look at, at how these things can be delivered in an innovative and flexible way. And those are top, typically where the opportunities will, will, will be in the in the foreseeable future. So, um, so yeah, let me stop there. Look, wonderful. And, and honestly, on behalf of the university and on behalf of the Austral Education Group, I want to thank you both for generously sharing your time, your experiences, your expertise, and your thoughts with us here today. It, this has been an incredible conversation. And I, I thank you both. This has been great. Thank you. Pleasure is on. Very nice meeting you. All the best. Good success. All the best, guys. Thanks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are due back at 1 p.m. British summer time. I will see you in the Zoom room then. Thank you so very much, Hendrik and Marcelo. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thank Good luck you. with the studies. Bye, everybody. Yes.